Good morning. Let us pray. Amazing God, speak through me or in spite of me for the benefit of your holy wisdom. Be in our heads and in our thinking, be in our hearts and in our loving. And humbly ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. Many of us will celebrate the, the day by eating corned beef and cabbage. Perhaps some of us will go out and drink some green beer. And some of us will wear green to mark the day, lest we risk being pinched for being green. It is a day where it is said that everyone is Irish. Famous St. Patrick's Day parades have already taken place in Boston and New York, and less famous ones have taken place in Boise and Paducah and even South Bend. It is the day to celebrate the lively Irish culture, the food and the music, the traditions and the heritage. As a proud people who have suffered much in the course of worldly affairs, their resilience and quick wit and beautiful expressions in the arts are to be enjoyed and respected. Now the legend of St. Patrick is incredible. He is attributed with performing a thousand miracles. There are accounts even of St. Patrick raising up to 33 people from the dead. It is said that wherever he went, he had a shepherd's staff made of ash wood, and that when he went into a new village to bring the message of the gospel, that he would plant his staff firmly in the ground and leave it there until he had converted the whole village to Christianity. As a result, the legend tells us that that is why there are so many ash trees all across Ireland, because everywhere he would plant his staff, groves of ash trees would grow. He is credited with consecrating 350 bishops, erecting 700 churches, and ordaining 5,000 Irish priests. In less than 30 years, the greater part of Ireland was converted to Catholicism, larger than life, his legend is. Now, you know, perhaps most notably, he is known for driving all the snakes out of Ireland. Myth and mystery follows every legend, of course. The story goes that St. Patrick went up a mountain to pray and fast for 40 days, just like Jesus did in the Gospels when he is tempted by Satan. And at the end of the 40 days, all the snakes in Ireland came to attack him, just like how the devil tempted Jesus at the end of his fast. And with that provocation, St. Patrick famously drives all of the snakes into the sea, thus freeing Ireland from the scourge of snakes. Funny thing, Ireland doesn't have any snakes. Never has, really. Scientists tell us that since the last ice age, Ireland has been an island separated from the mainland, surrounded by salt water that keeps the snakes from ever slithering onto Irish soil. But you see, this is a metaphor. St. Patrick didn't really drive all of the snakes out of Ireland. What he is attributed with doing is converting people to Christianity. Now, pagan peoples, who often worship snakes and use their imagery in their art and decoration, and Druid priests were known to have snakes tattooed on their bodies. And so as St. Patrick converted the native peoples to Christianity, he is credited by the Christian historians of the time of driving the pagans out of Ireland. And while I love everything that the St. Patrick's Day celebration stands for today, speaking to the Irish culture and heritage and the arts, I'm not so keen on St. Patrick himself. At least as the legend he has come to be when faced with the historical reality. His efforts to convert an entire community into the faith in the name of the church have been glamorized. 
He is, after all, considered a saint. A man driven by a divine mandate to save the people of Ireland from their pagan ways. Now keep in mind that back in the 5th century, this is the dualism that existed in the world. You were either on the right side or the wrong side of the faith debate. There was precious little room for any middle ground. You were either a Christian or you were a heathen. You were either someone who professed the right faith or you were considered a savage. You were either with us or you were against us. And as far as the church and your salvation was concerned. <coughs> and this ideology made things very, very messy. St. Patrick converted the kings and queens and tribal and clan rulers of his time all over Ireland whenever he went to a new village or city. And when these rulers converted, often so did everyone who was under their rule. Then, these clans and tribes would go out and fight with other clans and tribes that chose not to convert to Christianity. It was, for all practical accounts, at times a very bloody and violent affair. Here, the god of the 5th century church in Ireland is seen as the all-powerful, more, power, more powerful than any other god, God. And St. Patrick is often portrayed as a warrior for Christ, going into battle for the Christian God. The famous song, The Breastplate of St. Patrick, is well known. It is a song that glamorizes the armor of God that St. Patrick wears to protect him as he does battle for the lost souls of Ireland in the name of Christ. In this song, it speaks to how one binds the armor of our faith given to us in the Gospels to protect him as he prepares to carry the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, we hear this song, and it really is a beautiful song. And think about how our faith protects us from the evil that is in the world. We hear this song speaking to us as individuals. But back in the 5th century, when the song was not yet a song, but a bard's poem, it was heard by many to be about the protection against evil that our faith affords us when we go into battle against entire communities, clans, tribes, or nations. God is warrior. Saints dressed in the armor of their faith going into battle for souls against the forces of evil. Evil being everything that isn't Christian. It is an ugly image for us to imagine today. But in the 5th century, the historians of the time, as well as the church fathers, are completely focused on this world, in spite of the spiritual one. For them, the conquest of the entire known world in the name of Christ is their divine mandate. You know, I always imagine the church fathers at this time looking at a map of the known world and marking off the territories that have been converted and plotting on how to best invade the areas that have not been converted. A lot like the board game risk, strategizing for power and advantage. Always looking to the horizon to see how they can best play the game to position themselves, to take over more countries, establish more power, more wealth. Their whole world view was, ironically, for being people who profess a supernatural faith, solely focused most of the time on the physical world. Everything had to make sense in a literal way. Everything had to be clean and easy to understand in accordance with the Gospels. Now that's the same problem that Nicodemus has with Jesus. Nicodemus is so focused on the physical world that he has a hard time understanding Jesus when Jesus is talking about the spiritual world. Where Nicodemus is questioning the possibility of a rebirth of our physical bodies, Jesus is speaking to the need for us to experience a rebirth of our spiritual bodies. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, noted as a leader among the Jews. He is a part of the established religious authority of Jesus' time. 
And he is seeking out Jesus to see what Jesus is all about. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus has just finished turning over tables in the temple, driving all the vendors there to sell their wares to the pilgrims coming to celebrate Passover out of the holy temple with a whip, screaming, Take these things out of here! Stop making my father's house a marketplace! Now after a scene like that, I imagine word out on the street about Jesus is that he's a pretty intense kind of guy. And people are talking, and Nicodemus is curious. <coughs> Nicodemus is seeking. He is, like us today, people on a spiritual journey who are simply looking for the answers to life. How do we live? How do we be happy in a world filled seemingly with so much sadness and suffering? How do we be at peace in a world filled with so much violence? Nicodemus sees something in Jesus that makes him want to know more. More about him and more about the new way of life that Jesus is always talking about. The Gospel tells us, he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from one who has the presence of God. And Jesus answers him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. This question confuses Nicodemus. So Nicodemus asks Jesus another question. Nicodemus says, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? I feel every mother here cringe. <laughs> it is completely illogical. But here we can see that Nicodemus is only looking at what he knows about his physical body and the physical world he lives in. He is taking everything Jesus is saying literally. He is missing the metaphor here that holds the gift to new life, eternal life itself. Jesus further explains this mystery of our faith. Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. For the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it will go. So it is with everyone who is born in the Spirit. Honestly, Nicodemus is still confused. And so he says to Jesus, how can these things be? And Jesus recognizes him as a holy man and actually questions his lack of understanding and says, Are you not a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? And Jesus continues, Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. Here Jesus is speaking to the miracles he has performed, that the talk of which drew Nicodemus in the first place to seek him out. And Jesus continues, If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe me, the miracles that brought Nicodemus there in the first place, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here Jesus explains very clearly that our faith, this new way of living, of being reborn into the Spirit, is in this world, but not of this world. That what we see with our physical eyes in our physical world is only 
but a part of a greater equation. A formula that includes faith in things that are unseen. A faith in a power we cannot explain that we know is there even before we see it manifest in our physical world. Like the time that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness that Jesus speaks of. The people are wandering in the desert looking for the promised land in the book of Numbers. Along the way they are besieged by poisonous serpents. They are being bitten and they are dying. The Torah tells us this plague of serpents is the result of the Hebrew people complaining on their journey, thus losing their faith in God, being able to lead them to the Promised Land. As a result of the plague, the people who don't die repent, and God tells Moses to make a poisonous serpent sculpture and to set it high atop of a pole among the people. And then when anyone would be bitten, they would look at the pole, see the sculpture of the snake, remember the sin of their ingratitude, and then they would not die from the snake bite. In the narrative itself, the people didn't know how it worked, but it did, because they had faith in things that were unseen. Of course, this is another metaphor. We don't literally craft graven images of the things that can kill us today and set it high atop a pole so that we can look at it and it can save our lives. <coughs> but we know that God doesn't work like that. But this story does tell us that when our pride and our ingratitude get in the way of our relationship with God, that our lives, our spiritual lives, are at stake. We need God in a recognized dependence on God in order to live the glorious life God wants for us. Because God loves us. Next, Jesus utters some of the most well-known lines in all of our faith and in the Gospels when he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that anyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Such a love as this, the sacrifice of one's only Son for the sake of our very souls. The crucifixion on Good Friday that leads us to the glorious promise of new life and resurrection in the spirit of the miracle of Easter Sunday is what we're talking about. If we're lost, as we said at the beginning of our service, how do we then become bound? For a first century Jewish Pharisee like Nicodemus, how strange and foreign this must have all sounded. But Nicodemus is not the villain here. I believe that the writer of the Gospel of John places Nicodemus throughout the Gospel of John to be a place for us to enter the story. Nicodemus is us. He is representative of all of us, spiritually seeking, who are searching for that peace that Paul talks about that surpasses all understanding. And to know this, you must know God. Paul says this to us. Jesus says this to Nicodemus. And here Jesus is telling Nicodemus that God will be revealed through the life, death, and resurrection of God's Son, the Messiah. The Messiah who will not come as a warrior God, fighting for the souls of the lost, carrying the armor of our faith to protect him as he goes into battle. But a Messiah that comes into our world as a healer and a teacher, who talks instead of fighting, who leaves himself at the mercy of a Roman cross and not as a conquering hero. A Messiah who respects where a curious Pharisee is coming from, so much so that he doesn't cast him out as evil or savage, but welcomes him into a conversation where he takes the time 
to open up to him the mysteries of our faith for this world and the next. The impossibility of the existence of our physical and spiritual bodies and the change in perspective that this requires. The change is how we choose to see the world that is needed to be able to open ourselves up to a new life reborn into the spirit with our amazing God. And at this point, Nicodemus just doesn't seem to quite get it. But it's okay. If you read further on from the Gospel of John, at the end of the story, at the base of the cross, after Christ is dead, it is Nicodemus who shows up with a friend and an embarrassing amount of ointment to provide Jesus with a proper burial a sign of respect and care. He may have came to Jesus with questions, but he approaches Jesus' body with love. I'm here to tell you today that if you're ready to open yourself up to be born again into a new life blessed by the Holy Spirit, that our amazing God is waiting for you. Contrary to how many of our evangelical sisters and brothers may act. Being born again is not something you do that marks you as safe and then saves you a seat in some heavenly chorus. A life where we are given the new eyes to see the ways of the spirit that move unseen is how I would define being born again today. We are ever present in this physical world, but we're called to pay attention to the spiritual world. We, of course, want to care for our physical bodies, but we must be aware of and care for our spiritual bodies. And take heed. Our God is not the God of the 5th century who leads the faithful into battle to fight the savage unbelievers and leave a path of violence and power and wealth corrupted in its wake, driving entire cultures into the sea simply to protect the faith. Our God is not the God of the Old Testament who is going to punish us to teach us a lesson. Our God is a gentle and a listening God, patient and kind, who is willing to meet us wherever we are in our lives, who is loving and compassionate and understanding while we find our way to God. Our God is like Jesus, taking the time to talk to Nicodemus, answering our questions, and leaving us to decide when we will find our way in our faith. Our God is the God of love that the whole life of Jesus proclaims to us in the Gospels. Our God is, like Jesus, going to love us even when we don't love ourselves. Our God loves us even when we don't have all the answers. I would say even especially when we don't have all the answers. Our God loves us right where we're at, wherever that is, or whoever you are. And by doing so, when we seek God, when we go to God with our questions, seeking in our journeys of faith, that love will show us how to love ourselves. That love will lead us into a loving relationship with God. That love will create in us the ability to love others as we have found God to love us. And when you are willing to let this amazing experience of love into your life, that is when you are truly born again into the Spirit. When you let this love drive your life and the choices you make, being aware of your physical and your spiritual body, your physical and your spiritual life, the world of nature and the world of the supernatural. That is how we will live into this amazing promise, this promise of new life that our Savior offers to us from the cross. And all of God's people said amen.